James Leininger was two years old when he started screaming in the night. Not the ordinary terrors of childhood, monsters under beds, shadows in corners. No, James was burning alive, trapped in a cockpit. The little man couldn't get out. Over and over, the same nightmare. Fire, water, impact. His parents held him, confused and terrified. How does a toddler know the specific panic of a plane crash? How does he know what it feels like to die? Then the details began. James started drawing fighter planes, simple child sketches, yet filled with uncanny accuracy. The shapes, the markings, the way they fell from the sky. He signed them James III. When asked why, he said simply, because I'm the third James. He spoke of a ship, the Natoma Bay, a friend named Jack Larson, a place called Iwo Jima. He described being shot down, his plane hit in the engine, spiraling into the ocean in flames. His father, Bruce, a skeptic, a Christian, a man who believed reincarnation was, in his own words, bullshit, began to research. Desperate to prove his son wrong, desperate to find a rational explanation, what he found instead shattered him. There was a James Houston, James M. Houston Jr., a pilot who flew from the USS Natoma Bay, who had a friend named Jack Larson, who was shot down at Iwo Jima on March 3, 1945. Everything the boy said, impossibly, inexplicably, was true. But here's where the story stops being about one child and becomes about all of us. Because what if James Leininger wasn't remembering someone else's life? What if he was remembering his own? What if the boundary between James then and James now is nothing but an illusion we've agreed to believe? The question we're about to explore will feel dangerous. It should. Because once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you feel it, every moment of deja vu, every inexplicable emotion, every place that feels like home though you've never been there, they all become evidence. Evidence that you are not one, you are many. And all of your lives are happening right now. This isn't a story about reincarnation. This is something stranger. This is about echoes, about consciousness that doesn't end when you die but splits, refracts, continues across realities you can't see, but sometimes, just sometimes, you can feel. What if the memories that don't belong to you actually do? Memory is supposed to be biological. That's what they taught us, right? Encoded in synaptic connections, stored in the chemistry of neurons, bound to the architecture of your brain? This is the foundation the bedrock assumption of neuroscience. But biology has limits. You can't remember what you've never experienced. You can't know what you've never learned. Yet James, at age three, used military slang that didn't exist in children's books. He called Japanese fighters Zeeks, a nickname only veterans would know. He knew Corsairs had tire problems on landing a detail so obscure even aviation historians had to verify it. When the Liningers met surviving shipmates from the Natoma Bay at a memorial service, these old men, who had flown with Houston, went silent. The boy's mannerisms, his facial expressions, the way he held himself, they saw their dead friend alive again in miniature. This is where biography breaks where the container of selfhood starts leaking. The conventional move here is to either accept reincarnation as mysticism or reject the entire phenomenon as delusion. But both moves miss something crucial. They assume consciousness is generated by and contained within individual organisms. One body, one biography, one self. Pretty neat package, isn't it? What if that's exactly backwards? In quantum mechanics, there's a concept that physicists hate discussing at dinner parties because it sounds insane. 
The many worlds interpretation suggests that every quantum measurement doesn't collapse possibilities into one outcome, but instead causes reality to branch into multiple versions where all outcomes occur simultaneously. Every choice you didn't make, it was made by another version of you in another branch of reality. Most people treat this as science fiction, but here's what's strange. Physicist Dirk Meyer proposed that consciousness doesn't reside in the brain, but in a field surrounding it. A field that exists in dimensions beyond our familiar three of space. According to his model, the brain acts as a receiver, tuning into this field the way a radio receives signals. If consciousness is a field phenomenon rather than a brain-generated epiphenomenon, then you are not the product of neurons firing in your skull. You are something the neurons are tuning into, a frequency, a pattern in a much larger field. And here's where it gets dangerous to your sense of reality. Quantum entanglement demonstrates that particles can be correlated across any distance instantaneously without any signal passing between them. This non-locality suggests that at the quantum level, separation itself is an illusion. What if consciousness operates the same way? Neuroscientist Jill Bolte-Taylor, after experiencing a stroke that temporarily shut down the left hemisphere of her brain, reported a profound dissolution of boundaries. She described losing the sense of where her body ended and the universe began, experiencing consciousness as a field of awareness not contained by her individual self. This wasn't hallucination. It was the temporary failure of the neural machinery that normally creates the illusion of separation. You are not a discrete consciousness that somehow emerged from matter. You are a localized interference pattern in a consciousness field that was always already there. The same field, the same consciousness. Experiencing itself through billions of apertures we call organisms. Think of a hologram. If you cut a holographic plate in half, you don't get half the image. You get the whole image, just lower resolution. Every fragment contains the whole. Strange, right? Physicist Carl Pribram proposed that the brain operates like a quantum hologram, encoding consciousness as interference patterns distributed across neural networks rather than stored in specific locations. Not a filing cabinet, a holographic projection. This explains something impossible. How transplant recipients sometimes report sudden memories, preferences, or personality traits that belong to their organ donors. Hearts that remember. Kidneys that carry taste preferences. Livers that harbor fears. If information is encoded holographically throughout biological systems, then you are not confined to your brain. You are distributed, a pattern that extends beyond the meat. And if the pattern extends beyond the body, then what stops it from extending beyond this life? Beyond this timeline? Nothing. Nothing at all. The self is fractal. Each version of you, in this moment, in other choices, in other lives, is a self-similar iteration of the same fundamental pattern. The same consciousness, refracted through different conditions. James Leininger told his parents he chose them when they were at a pink hotel in Hawaii five weeks before his mother became pregnant. The Royal Hawaiian Hotel. Pink. Exactly as described. This is not memory of being in a womb. This is memory of existing as a disembodied consciousness, observing potential parents, making a choice. This is consciousness describing its own continuity across the supposed boundary of death. Here's a principle from physics that changes everything. Information cannot be destroyed. Even when a star collapses into a black hole, the information isn't lost. It's encoded on the event horizon, preserved in a two-dimensional surface around the singularity. 
what you've experienced, what you've felt, what you've known. This isn't just chemical traces in neurons, it's information. And information, according to physics, is eternal. Let that sink in. The infinite spiral staircase theory proposes that consciousness exists in a hyperdimensional field that pervades space-time at scales smaller than the Planck length, the smallest possible unit of space. This field, which physicist Chris Hardy calls the semantic field, serves as the organizational layer of reality itself. Every thought, every emotion, every moment of awareness, these are patterns in this field. They don't disappear when your brain stops. They can't disappear. They're woven into the structure of existence itself. Scientists have documented identical twins separated at birth who develop the same obscure phobias, laugh the same way, marry people with the same name. They call this genetic similarity. But what if it's something else? What if these twins are tuned to the same frequency in the consciousness field receiving the same signal through different bodies. This isn't metaphor. This is pattern recognition across supposedly separate minds. You are not contained in your biography. Your biography is one thread in a tapestry that extends across dimensions you can't perceive. And sometimes, in dreams, in deja vu, in moments of inexplicable knowing, other threads bleed through. There's a moment that happens to almost everyone, though we rarely speak of it. You're in a place you've never been, and suddenly, impossibly, you know what's around the corner. You know the layout of rooms you've never entered. You recognize faces you've never seen. You know this feeling, don't you? The rational mind calls this pattern recognition, unconscious inference, coincidence, but what if it's something simpler and stranger? Physicist Dirk Meyer's model suggests consciousness operates like the event horizon of a black hole, a boundary between the individual mind's internal model of reality and the universal information matrix that exists outside it. This boundary isn't impermeable, it's porous. When the boundary weakens, through trauma, meditation, psychedelics, near-death experiences, or sometimes just the random quantum fluctuations of neural activity, information from the larger field leaks through. You taste a food you've never eaten, and you know with absolute certainty that you've tasted it before. In another life, or in another branch of this life, in a reality where you made different choices and ended up in different places, the quantum principle of superposition suggests particles exist in multiple states simultaneously until observed. Our subjective experience mirrors this. We hold multiple possibilities in a kind of mental superposition, existing in a multidimensional space of potential. What if every choice you didn't make isn't hypothetical, but actual? What if you exist in parallel expressions making all the choices, living all the lives. And sometimes, when the quantum static clears, you hear the echoes of yourself living differently. The love you feel for a place you've never been isn't nostalgia for someone else's life. It's recognition. You have been there. In another configuration of reality, another role of the quantum dice, the ORCH-OR theory, proposed by Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff, suggests that consciousness isn't produced by neurons firing, but by quantum processes in the microtubules inside neurons, structures that can maintain quantum coherence. They argue that consciousness might have existed forever, with brains serving as receivers rather than generators. This is the transmission hypothesis. The brain doesn't create consciousness any more than a radio creates music. It tunes into it, translates it, localizes it into the experience of being an individual self. But the signal, consciousness itself, 
exists independently of the receiver. When James Leininger's brain was forming in the womb, something tuned into a frequency that carried the informational pattern of James Houston, not reincarnation in the sense of a soul jumping from body to body, more like a radio accidentally tuning into a station that was supposed to be silent. Or perhaps the same consciousness experiencing itself through a new aperture, briefly overlapping with the memory of its previous aperture. Maybe consciousness exists as a unified field and individual minds are localized expressions within that field. The boundaries we experience, the walls between me and not me, are constructions of the neural machinery, not features of consciousness itself. So where does this leave you? Sitting there, listening to these words, probably feeling a strange mixture of fascination and fear. Because if any of this is true, if consciousness really is non-local, if yourself really is a distributed pattern in a larger field, if the memories and emotions that feel so intimately yours might be echoes from other lives, other choices, other realities, then who are you? Here's the answer that won't satisfy you, but might be true. You are all of it, every version, every choice, every life. You are not the single thread, but the entire tapestry, experiencing itself one thread at a time. The deja vu isn't a glitch. It's a moment of recognition. The sorrow with no cause isn't pathology. It's genuine grief from another expression of you reaching across the boundaries of reality. You've never been singular. You've never been separate. The borders of yourself have always been permeable, fictional, useful conveniences for navigating three-dimensional space, but ultimately illusions. Physicist David Bohm described reality as consisting of an implicate order, an underlying undivided wholeness from which emerges the explicate order we experience. Both mind and matter are projections from this deeper, unified level. You are not in the universe. You are the universe, localized into the particular frequency pattern you call yourself. And every other version of you, in parallel timelines, past lives, future existences, these aren't separate beings. They're other notes in the same chord. The James Leininger case isn't proof of reincarnation. It's evidence that consciousness doesn't operate according to the rules we thought governed reality. It's an anomaly that points to a deeper pattern. And you? You carry anomalies too. Memories that don't fit your biography. Loves that predate your experience. Fears that reference traumas you never lived through. These aren't malfunctions. They're transmissions. From other versions of you, broadcasting through the quantum static, trying to tell you something you already know but keep forgetting. You are not trapped in this single story, this single body, this single lifetime. You are the consciousness that dreams all of them into being. And if all consciousness is one, then every life, yours, mine, his, is simply the same awareness exploring different shapes of being. And somewhere, right now, another version of you is watching this same moment, feeling the same recognition, hearing the same echo. An echo that doesn't fade. It only changes form. 